Schneider, the President of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. I'm delighted to have all of you with us this evening for the opening event of our new program season. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and electronic devices. Actually, I'm going to do that myself. A little visual aid. Um, we do encourage you, however, to tweet after our speaker's remarks and also invite you always uh, to like the World Affairs Council on Facebook. I'd like to first thank our sponsors for this evening's program, the Doran Family Foundation and Cross Atlantic Capital Partners. Along with the launch of our new program season, we're also beginning a new school year, of course, and I'd like to note the presence here tonight of uh, 38 students and 30 teachers from 22 schools in both the Philadelphia area and South Jersey. Some of the more than 2,100 area middle and high school students that are touched by the council's education program each year. With uh, the coming of fall, we also invigorate our destinations in our flagship Travel the World program. Some of you may have seen the New York Times take note uh, last week of our planned trip to Iran, which I will be leading in the spring. But there are many other destinations as well, and I invite you to consider this really most enlightening way to travel. The Council's program season promises to be filled with engaging events. There are too many of them to take note of from the podium tonight, but I hope that you'll review the offerings and most especially consider attending our annual Atlas Award program on September the 30th, at which Connecticut Governor Daniel Malloy will accept the award on behalf of America's first responders, so many of whom have been put to the ultimate task during the past year of natural and man-made disasters, and I'm sure all of you know from the news accounts we had another one today. Of course, our historic uh, debate uh, is also coming up on the state of American politics between distinguished former Senators Evan Bayh and Fred Thompson to be held on October 7th at Congress Hall. Capitol Building of the United States from 1790 to 1800. This program is part of the Stan and Arlene Ginsburg Family Foundation Great Debates series of the Council and will be the first event uh, ever webcast from Congress Hall uh, thanks to the support of Comcast. Turning to our program at hand, I want to make a, a personal note. When I first came to work at the Council uh, when I was in college, I remember the then executive director, Bunsey Churchill, who's with us tonight, um, who was in her 40s at the time, and amazingly still is. <laughs> um, I remember asking her how she felt about knowing personally many of the speakers who presented from the council's podium. She told me basically, just wait and see. When you reach your 40s and 50s, your peers end up running the world. It was a really strange idea to me at the time. It didn't seem plausible. Uh, but this evening, in preparing, uh, I couldn't uh, but reflect on the wisdom of that particular piece of advice from Bunsey. Both of our principal speakers this evening, Congressman Meehan uh, and Martin Gelman, are longtime personal friends of mine. Pat and I go back to a shared history as staffers for Senator Specter, uh, and I know very well. Uh, how he has earned each step of an outstanding career, leading to his present position uh, as chairman of the Cybersecurity su uh, Subcommittee of the Homeland Security Committee, uh, the position from which uh, he'll address us this evening. Uh, this isn't the kind of post in the House that a member gets in order to get many points back home. There is not a lot of digital bacon to be had. Um, but it's the kind of position that just might save the country. So we look forward to hearing uh, the Congressman's uh, reflections on this important role that he's chosen to take on. Uh, Bart Gelman and I go back even further uh, to high school at George Washington in Northeast Philly. Believe it or not, we worked together on the high school newspaper. And um, this is gonna come as a shock to you, uh, Bart seemed to take a liking to journalism, uh, which resulted in uh, two Pulitzer Prizes, and a simply unmatched record of scoops on the most important issues of American national security, including, of course, uh, the stories uh, that have made uh, Mr. Snowden a household name around the world. 
We've divided this evening's exploration of the new realities and threats in the digital age into two sort of baskets of policy questions. First, Congressman Meehan will address the external threats to the United States from potential cyber attacks, whether by nations or non-state actors, whether aimed at traditional military and government targets or aimed at our private sector infrastructure. And Mr. Gelman will be addressing in the form of an interview and conversation uh, that I'll be conducting with him, the NSA domestic surveillance controversy and all of the related questions regarding the balance between security and privacy. To formally introduce Congressman Meehan and to set the stage for the Congressman's remarks with a, a primer on cybersecurity issues, we also have with us this evening Lawrence Husick, a fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, Lawrence regularly plays the same role for the World Affairs Council as President Clinton plays for President Obama, Secretary of Explaining Stuff. <laughs> uh, so, for that explanation to commence, please join me in welcoming Lawrence Houston. Stephen Levy in his book, Hackers. That is, I am a person who enjoys the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming limitations in systems through clever exploitation of engineering design. <laughs> now that definition has long since been eclipsed by the popular one, what we in the hacker community know as the black hat hacker. There are also, as it might not surprise you, white hat hackers and gray hat hackers. But hacking has become a thing of national and international concern, as demonstrated by the following headlines from just the last few days. One, Android Trojan spreads through mobile botnet, whatever that is. Two, DDoS attacks occur on average every two minutes. Three. The Russian cybercrime market is now worth $1.9 billion per year. And four, NSA documents show the spy agency violated privacy rules. So what is this whole thing about cybersecurity? Why do we worry about hacking? Well, I think it comes down to something called Beckstrom's Law of Cybersecurity. Rod Beckstrom was the founding director of the United States National Cybersecurity Center. The law goes like this. One, anything attached to a network can be hacked. Two, everything is attached to networks. <laughs> Three, everything is vulnerable. To which I add my own gloss, number four. Some things are vulnerable because they can be attacked from far away and in ways that are difficult to predict because we have built the most complex system ever built by man, the internet. So some history, very quickly. In the 1960s, we invented the internet to survive a Russian nuclear strike. We gave it a certain form of intelligence and ability to repair itself. By 1971 or so, we'd been sending emails by 1981, we started building these little computers and letting them control everything in our lives. But we didn't worry about security. In 1988, the first computer worm was leashed on the internet and took 20% of it down. It was put out there inadvertently by the 23-year-old son of an NSA employee. <laughs> by 2006, we had turned the internet into a weapon and we were using it against Iran's nuclear program. And if Mr. Gelman's articles can be believed, in 2011, the United States conducted 231 cyber offensive operations and controlled over 85,000 malware compromised systems around the world. So what is the strategic implication? Well, during the Cold War, we were governed by MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. That is no longer the case. We're no longer toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Soviet nuclear arsenal. And now we face something far more difficult. 
we at FPRI call it MUD, multilateral unconstrained disruption. Multilateral because it's not just state actors, it's non-state actors, terrorist groups, criminal syndicates, and 15-year-olds sitting in their parents' basement. Unconstrained because the targets are not just military in nature, they're literally everything, every device. And disruption because the goal of these hackers, these black hats, is to disrupt our way of life, our economy, our ability to communicate, our ability to live as we do for their own goals, whether those are political or criminal. That, I think, helps us to understand this gobbledygook of acronyms that we hear in the news every day. It's just computers and networks just being leveraged to do things they were never designed to do. Let me introduce my friend Pat Mead. I'm told that if you look in the dictionary under the words crusading DA, you'll find his picture. I'm proud to say that long ago and far away I practiced law with him. We were in the same firm together. And he now represents Pennsylvania's 7th District in the Congress after an illustrious career, first as a district attorney in Delaware County and then as U.S. attorney here in Philadelphia. I can think of no one more qualified to protect us from all of those black hats, and I ask you to welcome Congressman Pat Meehan. Well, thank you, Larry, for that very, very kind introduction, and uh, and to Craig as well, uh, two old friends, and 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 Craig's. Uh, observation uh, through Buncey about the ability to grow with your friends over time. These are both, we were each young in our own way working together on the professional pursuits before us and uh, it's great to come back and to see how, how you have grown and uh, to be part of a, a great format like this. Uh, I also, and, and I'd be remiss, I think we'll, we all, you know, the elephant in the room, for the moment, uh, remarkable events again in Washington, D.C. And I just want to take a moment and to uh, reflect for a second on the brave people who gave their lives today and the uh, tragedy at the Navy base in Washington. Well, let me say thank you again for the, for the chance to be here. I went through a little bit of an interesting then, just a few weeks ago, I dropped my youngest son and last one for sending to college off at uh, Bowdoin College for his first year where, where I had gone uh, in the mid-70s. And in many ways, you know, the, it's, it's still the sort of same leafy campus and uh, beautiful buildings, and it's kind of fun to watch the regeneration. But if there was something I'd noticed uh, in particular, a dramatic change. I, I was there in the mid '70s, where the world of computers and other things. If you if you wanted to take a computer, in my time, uh, there was a mainframe somewhere down in the science building, and you might be able to go down there and learn a little bit something about writing code. My recollection was the most important thing that they did was they set up the whole campus for one great big computer day. And uh, I think I remember the poor young woman who was assigned to me, and she sort of looked at me and she said, well, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> but in any event, I returned to watch my son and to see the personal devices and 4G and how they were communicating with each other instead of reaching around the room, sending text messages and other kinds of things. But it's an implication how dramatically just in one generation, the world of communication, particularly cyber communication, has changed. And it's certainly driven, in a, in a lot of ways, the capacity to bring the world to the fingertips in a real way at each and every one of those students. And it's also driven the capacity for us to communicate in a worldwide way so that we are really as close 
as one student was to his former roommate in Asia as that one across the hall. So the dramatic growth of communication, the dramatic growth of, a, of an economy that's built on this, this system, as Larry so well identified of this, this internet, has created, at the same time, huge vulnerabilities. We are a nation that has been accustomed through generations to being protected by the, by the physical presence of two major oceans and two relatively friendly neighbors north and south of us. And now for the first time in the um, you know, relative history by virtue of this, we find ourselves in the kind of circumstance where we can be accessed from anywhere in the world. And by many, as was identified, uh, not just state actors, but a broad spectrum. And so it's within that context that we deal with the changing nature of what has been so positive, but also a stark and sort of realistic recognition of that which creates challenges to our security and therefore the ability for us with our responsibilities to protect and otherwise the, the, the constant tension that exists on the kind of protection versus privacy, something that is at the heart of what you will hear about later, but at the heart of the decisions that are made each and every day. So from individual hackers to criminal rings to nation states to terrorists, America's adversaries aim to disrupt or destroy our information infrastructure. It's an issue that's at the forefront of national security concerns. And America's top leaders in defense, in industry, in homeland security have recognized the immediate need for adequate threat mitigation and defense mechanisms. Now, I'm going to put this in the context of what are we really talking about? And I often, as a prosecutor, we used to say, you don't really have to tell the story. Put the witness on the stand and let the witness tell the story in their own words. And that is what will really be persuasive to the jury. So let me use the words of the witnesses. And you, the jury, listen not just to what they say, but those who are saying it in the positions that they hold in our nation. The first is former FBI, just recently changed, FBI Director Robert Mueller. And he said that the cyber threat will succeed terrorism very soon as the greatest threat to our country. Imagine how focused we are already on the threat of terrorism, but cyber will succeed it. General Keith Alexander, the current director of the National Security Agency, said that the loss of intellectual property through cyber espionage is the greatest transfer of wealth in history. Former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta was, in, was, was sort of influential on me. This is the first speech that Leon Panetta delivered after he had stepped down as Secretary of Defense. And he chose to go to New York City only days thereafter, and he delivered a speech on this topic. He talked about the concept of a cyber Pearl Harbor. And when speaking of the attacks, said that those attacks could soon shift from simple espionage to destruction. The director of national intelligence, Jim Clapper, said that potentially destructive lethal technology continues to become easier to access, and we foresee a cyber environment in which emerging technologies are developed and implemented before security responses can even be put into place. We are rushing headlong in many positive ways through the continued race to develop the next great breakthrough with the capacity of the internet. But at the same time, we often leave behind the thought about what it does, what we need to do to protect ourselves. We know that the Department of Homeland Security has tracked 200,000 cyber incidents over the past year. And a cyber incident is a significant event. That's a 68% increase over last year. Cyber incident. Now that is different than just the kind of hacks and other things. I spent uh, some time just a, a month or so ago up in New York meeting with the various banks that are 
part of our financial sector. On any given day, the bank, a major New York bank throughout its networks around the world, will be, so to speak, hit by somebody who's trying to probe it for some particular reason as many as a billion times a day. A billion times a day. And companies are now spending, many companies are spending over $100,000 a week just to fight intrusions. So what does this all mean? Certainly it means we're facing new challenges to our security of our assets and a greater appreciation of their vulnerability. I was struck when I was visited in my first week as the cyber chairman by the business roundtable. This is the collaboration of CEOs from America's top corporations who related to me that cybersecurity was the greatest concern that they had going into the year. But it means something else too. It means we're thrust into a new paradigm of public-private collaboration. And that's because more than 90% the cyber assets are in non-governmental hands. And that's the thing that's changed. It used to be you left defense to the Department of Defense. You didn't worry about it. You know, they were the ones with the tanks and the ships, and you were okay. But now, the field of challenge, or the field of battle, so to speak, is in the hands of the private sector. 90% of it. So the government really only has a small part the overall challenge, and yet all of it needs to be defended. For operational purposes, the vast uh, things of sort of private and, and quasi-private uh, industries have been aligned into 16 sectors. For example, financial services, healthcare, energy, transportation, telecommunication. And these assets are owned and run privately, but they're attacked indiscriminately. So to be protected, it's essential that information about the threats be shared in real time. Sometimes the threat analysis is best performed by our intelligence or law enforcement agencies, but as often the sophisticated private sector security operations at banks or technology companies, for example, are as knowledgeable and competent as that of the government. And they rely on each other to share information that maximizes our protection. And therein lies the real challenge, because for the first time, we've got to be able to find some way that we can speak to each other, the private sector and the government sector, and to share information, but to do at the same time to be able to protect privacy and other kinds of things. It's a great challenge. Tonight's discussion takes place within the context of the recent revelations of the NSA's mishandling of information. So let me say just a couple of words about that. I come to this issue as a former United States attorney who swore an oath to uphold the Constitution to protect our nation from all foes, foreign and domestic, and to preserve those liberties enshrined within the Bill of Rights. So based upon that experience, I believe that no government agency can go unchecked or unmonitored, and Congress must continue responsible oversight of the NSA's programs. But make no mistake about it, our intelligence programs are vital to our security. And these programs have been critical in preventing the kinds of attacks against our home front that our adversaries continue to plan and work towards. However, however well-meaning those efforts are, though, certain lapses brought to light by the NSA revelations call for more focused oversight of domestic intelligence activity by Congress and, where appropriate, the FISA court. As a nation, we will continue a healthy debate on these issues and seek further reforms to safeguard our liberty. And as members of the Homeland Security Committee, I am committed to achieving the proper balance between our security and our liberties. But let me tell you the threat, and the threat is real. Let me just talk for a minute about a couple of the specific cyber attacks which have taken place around the world. Last year, Saudi Arabia's national oil company, Aramco, fell victim to a cyber attack that destroyed 30,000 computers. Hackers from a group called the Cutting Sword of Justice claimed responsibility for the attack, saying that the motives were aimed at stopping oil production in Saudi Arabia. But think about it, the capacity to do that. 
Early in this year, websites of several United States banks, including the Bank of America, PNC, Wells Fargo, the New York Stock Exchange, slowed, or in some cases, crashed. Experts say these denial-of-service attacks were the work of Iranian hackers in retaliation for U.S. sanctions against Iran. And there's a difference there because what we have seen, of course, is the denial of services which enabled the United States banks to get back up again after they figured out the probe. But make no mistake about it, when I discussed the idea that the Iranians considered it to be in response largely to Stuxnet, it was a signal. It was the proverbial shot across the bow demonstrating that we have a capacity. And imagine what it would be like if here in America today you went home tonight and you had no confidence that that machine that gave out that information was accurately reflecting what you believe to be the money or assets or other things that you had in our banking system. How much that could disrupt not just everyday lives, but the confidence of Americans, something as simple as where you keep your money. Just recently, the United States Marine Corps' website was hacked and redirected visitors to a message critical of President Obama and called it American soldiers. They called the American soldiers brothers of the Syrian army. The hack was attributed to the Syrian Electronic Army. You may have heard the Syrian Electronic Army. They're a hacking group that's loyal to Assad. They were also reportedly responsible for crashing the New York Times website just a few weeks ago. Now some experts may tell you that this group is not sophisticated enough to launch a major cyber attack against the United States, and that's probably true. But their capabilities were good enough to penetrate the Marines and the Times websites for purposes of propaganda. And their initial success could, could encourage the support of the Syrian government and their allies for a more consequential assault on our interests. And given the intensely hostile situation right now between the United States on one hand, and Syria, Iran, and even Russia on the other, I'm personally extremely concerned about a possible cyber attack from these countries. And there's doubts that Syria alone could pull something like that off. Let there be no mistake about the capabilities of Iran. Just this week, House and Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Rogers said he would not be surprised if a sophisticated nation like Iran is plotting a cyber attack on Wall Street. And former DHS Secretary Napolitano said this week that she sure is worried about a possible cyber attack in retaliation if the U.S. strikes Syria. Russia's not overlooked in the cyber realm either. But they have a capability and illustrated their capabilities and intent in past actions, actually invasions or incursions into Estonia and Georgia, dismantling the cyber capacity of those nations before acting. And as our main traditional adversary in the game of espionage, I view cyberspace as a new sort of modern Cold War battlefield in, Russia, in which Russia will continue its campaign against U.S. interests and we must prepare and respond appropriately. And undoubtedly, the cyber threat from China is of equal concern. Tom Donlin, the president's national security advisor, outed China as the place where cyber intrusions are emanating on an unprecedented scale. I can confirm that, and that is so much of what's going on with the cyber espionage, the probing of everything from our research facilities to to, to businesses, to, to you know, local banking, just the, the constant and persistent activity uh, on the part of China who steal our intellectual property and then use it in the development of the very materials that they then use to compete against us. So it may sort of sit here and think, boy, this whole thing is so overwhelming. You know, how do you make sense of it? What I like to do is put it into a context. And we used to call, we call it the 80-15-5 principle. 80% 80 of the issues that we're handling can be dealt with by something called simple cyber hygiene. And this is where each of you has a role. 
Because notwithstanding the idea they talked about a billion attacks that may be going on a bank, the truth of the matter is most of those things in the context of the real cyber world are like gnats on a windshield. But what you do to understand and participate in the protection of systems, simple things as being told not to bring that little device from someplace else and plug it into a computer system in another, it, you know, they, they use those to, to backdoor into systems. And so things that are being done with cyber hygiene can protect 80% of the threats that we face in this nation. And that even goes to the, you know, the, the relatively sophisticated attacks. The next 615, the next 15% are somewhat more serious. They're the ones from the groups like Anonymous or other hacktivists, which have the potential uh, to be extremely disruptive from shutting down a company or agency's operations to criminal rings that seek to capture American identities for the purpose of theft or fraudulent activities. The scope of these and capabilities of these groups range from costly nuisances to causing panic or fear in the market, similar to those of the Syrian Electronic Army. But then again, this is where the defenses are put together in a most sophisticated way by a lot of the institutions, the banks and others, and I think that that 15% is capable of being handled, again, mostly by the kind of sophisticated systems that are put in place by Mandiant and other kinds of, 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 of security hardware. But it's this last 5%, and this is the essence of where we deal, and I am dealing in our capacity in the Homeland Security Committee and others. And these are the actions that we see, largely by the state-sponsored groups. A word that was used by some well, one of the guys that I really sort of respect, he called it when they're inside the wire. This means that they have found the capacity to penetrate even the most sophisticated systems that we have to protect ourselves. Those that are in position, the Department of Defense, or a Chase Manhattan Bank, or at one of our nuclear facilities. Inside the wire, how do we deal with that kind of a threat? The capacity to infiltrate even the most secure systems taxes the protection capabilities of even the most advanced players in the government and private sector. In the chess game of cybersecurity, there's a persistent thrust and parry from the sophisticated state actors, principally China, which requires a public-private partnership but there's an insufficient body of law to guide and define the terms of this interaction. Most of the engagement that we have is directed through a bunch of things called presidential directives, rather than the statutes, and the statutes more effectively define the roles and boundaries that identify how the public sector and the private sector can work together. And that's the essence of what we are doing right now down in Washington in the form of trying to create legislation to help us deal with this issue. When I took over as chairman of the Cyber Subcommittee in January, one of my goals was to discuss these concerns with the private sector in a way that not only strengthens the public-private partnership, but also builds trusts and encourages information sharing between government and industry. And together with Chairman Mike McCall and the Homeland Security Committee, we've made it our priority to craft legislation based upon the input and insight of those who know the threat best. The federal government should be acting as a coordinator, disseminating accurate, timely information on threats and facilitating a public-private public partnership that incentivizes private sector participation and improves the architecture of security for our critical infrastructure. We must focus on the primary ways that we can prevent and contain attacks. Frankly, the innovation for protection has currently been developed more in the private sector and also in our national defense systems. But to sufficiently protect networks, there has to be a cohesive process to share information about threats and deterrence methods. And in order to do this then, there are really three key things that we think we've got to accomplish in Congress. The first is the ability to share information that must be coordinated by an effective civilian body that has the proper authorities and capacity to facilitate this exchange throughout all sectors of the United States. 
NSA Director General Keith Alexander sees this as the Department of Homeland Security, a civilian agency which is the entry point for working with industry. They utilize something called the National Cyber Center Communications Integration Center, known as NCIC, at the Department of Homeland Security, which served as a centralized location to assess vulnerabilities, intrusions, and mitigate and provide recovery efforts. But again, I point to the fact that right now, the practice of many is for the businesses to want to go to the FBI or the NSA. This sends it through a civilian agency, the Department of Homeland Security. <coughs> The NCIC lacks proper authority right now to discharge this task, though, and the mechanism to engage the key participants from the private sector. So to encourage participation in free inf uh, exchange of information, Congress has to be mindful of legal and fiduciary roadblocks that exist to the sharing of the information. It doesn't do any good to be able to identify and possess the tools to prevent an attack if they're legally or practically prohibited from acting. So currently, our laws are unclear and furthermore too archaic to prudently allow industry to share information without fear of litigation. Additionally, in order to provide guarantee the necessary privacy safeguards for both American citizens and American businesses, we must create a transparent structure that ensures that only threat information is shared. And the government and industry are left with without, with uh, out methods to collect, store, or share personally identifiable information. Likewise, we must make sure that we encourage sharing by providing protections for stakeholder identifiable information. The ability to anonymize personal and industry data is crucial to full and successful participation. What I mean by anonymization is really interesting, it's the, it's the ones and zeros that is really what we need to be using because the fact of the matter is the key to understanding this, how a system is, is how a system is being exploited, not the information that is being exchanged and that is what is being worked on. The ability to share the ones and zeros to identify the nature of the exploitation and therefore enable the best information about the kind of attack that's being used and the most effective defenses to it. Not the substance of the information itself that's critically important as we look for ways to allow the public and private sector to work together. Our plan is to approve the cybersecurity bill at committee level this fall and bring it to the House floor. Our bill works with other legislative efforts and is meant to complement the President's executive orders and framework laid out by something called the National Institute of, of, of Standards and Technology, while reining in any potential backdoor regulations that would cause even more problems for the ability of, of sectors to participate. And we believe that in order to encourage the kind of information sharing that will truly protect ourselves and our critical infrastructure from attack, the long-term the long-term home for our cybersecurity strategy must be housed in the Civilian Homeland Security Department, not the NSA. After I conclude, we'll hear from journalist Bartman Gelman, who of course has been reporting on the Snowden documents. In the debate on the House floor, Chairman Rogers, in defending our foreign surveillance programs, committed to it enacting even further reforms to protect civil liberties. I'm working with him on that effort. As we continue that work, I should note that what may, many in the audience may already know. Last Friday, Judge Dennis Saylor of the FISA Court, which must approve all surveillance warrants, instructed the White House to declassify all legal opinions relating to Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which was written after May 2011, that are already that are not already the subject of FOIA litigation. That Section 215 is the one that deals with the concerns about about phone records, the so-called metadata. In his first order, the first ever by the FISA court ordering declassification, declassification of information by an administration, Judge Saylor said that the unauthorized disclosure. In June 2013 of a Section 215 order, 
and government statements in response to that disclosure have engendered considerable public interest and debate about Section 215. Publication of the FISA court opinions relating to this opinion would contribute to an informed debate. And I think that will give us the kind of capacity for more to understand not only the nature of what went on in terms of what has been uh, uh, you know, alleged to, to, to have occurred, but also I think the court was interested in allowing people to see the great extent to which the balance of powers has been able to operate within this context. Now there, as I said before, the need for oversight but there are effective checks and balances that at least were written into the system. And I think the court was interested in assuring that people understood the scope of what was there and what steps they had taken in the past to assure that. We intend to have just that kind of a debate in the House, an informed debate about the need to focus on the government, government's counter-terror and counter-espionage efforts on the individuals and entities that mean to do us harm while at the same time protecting the privacy rights of law-abiding American citizens. In my opinion, Mr. Snowden should have brought his concerns to the intention of the Inspector General at NSA or the relevant Congressional Oversight Committees and enabled the internal checks and balances to be given a chance to operate before he made his way to China and Russia where he disclosed information on our measures to monitor and combat the espionage efforts of those states against the United States. That said, you will certainly see that no one other than Jim Clapper just the other day believed and that this will enable us once again to have the kind of healthy debate that will, that will allow people to understand the nature of what is happening as we continue to try to define the right level where we, as I articulated, identified very real and serious and the kinds of threats that could dramatically impact life within the United States, balanced against the very real thing that makes America what it is, which is the protection of the individual and privacy of each of those individuals constitutionally protected. It will be an ongoing bit of work. I will say that I was sort of struck when Mr. Snowden made one comment and he was talking to our next speaker. I think our next speaker, I just read one of the things and he said, uh, you know, are you worried about the security and the, the impacts of what you did? And, and he said, this was a Snowden, we managed to survive greater threats in our history than a few disorganized terrorist groups in rogue states without resorting to these sorts of programs. Well, that's a judgment that he made. But from my experience, they are not disorganized terrorist groups. You see what is going on in Syria today with sophisticated terrorist organizations backed by Iran. And nation states like Iran and North Korea pose a persistent and real threat, not just to the United States, but the security of the world. And it is in that context that the judgment by an individual has to be appreciated because each and every one of us is now put into a position by virtue of what he has done. I know our next speaker has the remarkable challenge of knowing a lot more than anybody else and constantly making those decisions about what it is that should be exposed in the context of what the fourth estate does from the Jeffersonian principles of her past to share that which is necessary versus that notwithstanding its the nature uh, should, should be kept private. I look forward to his commentary. I look forward to the ability to continue to work on these vitally important issues for our nation's security and the safety of the world. And I thank you for giving me a chance to be with you tonight.
Congressman's uh, uh, important remarks, and I think we I think we may have heard some some news this evening in terms of the content of legislation about cybersecurity being drafted in Washington. Um, ran uh, a little longer uh, than we originally planned, but but we we welcome uh, those changes from this podium because we want to do what's right by the substance of the topic. So I'm going to put off um, some questions at this point. Have uh, Bart Gellman come up. Uh, we'll do a, a little bit of discussion back and forth, and then we'll open it to questions uh, from you for either of the speakers. Bart, would you come up and join us? Of the decision making uh, that you and the Post and others uh, in, uh, in journalism uh, when faced with this kind of issue. So there is uh, a, a confidential source that has information that has been classified. Um, that source is seeking to have that information uh, made public. <coughs> what is, what's the nature of the judgment process that you and the Post went through with respect to the Smithsonian case, to the extent you can summarize that for us, to decide whether to go with it and what to go with? Well, it's not the first time in my uh, journalistic career when I've had access to uh, classified information and had to make that kind of decision. It is sui generis in terms of the sensitivity of the information and the quantity of it. Uh, the way we've handled it is about the way we've handled things in the past with one exception. I'll start with the exception. The material is very sensitive. Uh, I don't believe, and my editors at the Washington Post don't believe, that uh, all of it, possibly even most of it, ought to be made public. Uh, it's no use uh, sort of uh, taking a bow and saying, well, we're too responsible to uh, publish this or that, and then leave it on a system where uh, our foreign adversaries or hackers or uh, terrorists can get at it. And so we have taken very considerable precautions to protect the material, uh, including uh, uh, not putting it on anything that touches a network. <laughs> uh, uh, because it's correct that there are uh, quite advanced threats that could sneak in and, and, uh, and grab it, uh, even if we think we're taking pretty good measures. So it's on air-gapped computers and encrypted and lots of other things that I won't talk about in detail. Uh, as far as our own publishing decisions, uh, there are, feel free to raise your hand at the question time and say, who the hell elected you? Uh, because it's a natural question. Uh, I, I think there, there are two quite fundamental core constitutional and political <coughs> interests that are uh, sometimes clashing here. You've got, well, you've got self-government and self-defense. Uh, defense is one of six uh, major purposes of the Constitution as stated in the preamble. There are six, it's not just one. Uh, we are not competent to decide on our own what is a threat to the national defense, what is a threat to national security. Uh, which is why we don't try to decide on our own. We have quite extensive consultations with the government on, so they, and literally give a fact-by-fact fact summary uh, to the office of the DNI and often to subject matter experts at the 16 agencies uh, and hear out uh, any objections they may have. And uh, so far, throughout three months of stories, uh, have reached an accommodation that everybody could live with every time uh, almost always at my level, uh, and they have many other levels available to them uh, if, if that's what they want to do. But besides the fact that I'm not confident that the Washington Post is not competent on its own to decide on, on security, uh, I would argue that the president is not competent to, and I would say even uh, stronger, I would say that the president is forbidden to decide what we the people need to know in order to hold him accountable for his performance of the job. Uh, as a thought experiment, you could not allow the president to say, here's a big pile of information you're allowed to use when you make your next vote or when you decide what bill you want to lobby for or any other constitutionally protected activity. Uh, and here's a pile that you can't. Uh, you can't allow anybody who's accountable to the people to have that power 100%. Uh, and in fact, I, I've given a set of lectures on this, which I'm happy to point to afterward uh, if anybody wants to really delve into it. I don't believe there's any one institution that can do this. And so you have a system which is a little bit reminiscent of, uh, of uh, 
free markets in other contexts, which is you have uh, you have people like me trying to find out secrets, government trying to keep them, and that's a competitive stage. And then there is a collaborative stage at which we come together, have a conversation about what's at stake. And I'll tell you the very first conversation I had, and I'll ask you an expression about when I, uh, for the very first story I did, which was about prison, the program uh, under which the NSA has access to information on the servers at uh, nine big internet companies, most of Silicon Valley. Uh, it was a 41 page PowerPoint deck. And the Washington Post ended up reproducing, I don't know, altogether seven or eight of those slides. And in my very first conversation with someone at a quite high level at DNI, I said, and we were talking on the phone, so we didn't go into a lot of details. I said, everything on pages 21 to 28, we're not even considering. So it was, a, it was a way of starting a conversation to show that, you know, there are a few things we can recognize as being quite dangerous. And there were a few things that I didn't expect they would have a strong reaction to. Um, even in one case, a hypothetical, a made-up example with sort of fake names, conspicuously fake names. And they asked me to take out certain parts of that. And I was fascinated by the fact that the hypothetical, they thought it was dangerous, but I believe them. Check it out. Um, let's, let's talk about prison. Um, in your view, why is the collection of metadata, absent individualized suspicion, a civil liberties issue? Okay, well, so prison and metadata overlap a little bit, but the, the main, the main uh, metadata collections are in other things, including in Section 15, which is the Congress described. Uh, let's, let's talk about what's happening. It, uh, Section 215, all this uh, jargon. Let me try to sort of just say it very simply. Uh, the NSA beginning in around 2002 and then formalized uh, by the FISA Court in 2006 began going to all the big phone companies and collecting the records of every single phone call made by every single American, uh, whether national, international, local, domestic. Every single call made by every one of you and everybody else who lives in the United States has been collected, not the content, the metadata. What's that mean? Who you called, who called you, when you called them, how long you spoke, certain uh, technical characteristics about your communication devices, uh, which could uniquely identify you in case, uh, in case other things don't identify you. And what, what the um, NSA does with those things typically is it draws essentially a three-dimensional map. It uses um, very advanced mathematics and computational techniques. And we're talking about trillions with a T of telephone calls uh, to map relationships, networks, nodes uh, among us. So why is it a civil liberties issue? I have no reason to believe that this is being collected uh, in some Orwellian sense in order to um, oppress the American people to seek political or uh, improper financial advantage or any of the other things you would, ex you would worry about with this kind of power in the hands of a dictator. But in terms of Orwell, I mean, it, it is a power that is a uh, surveillance power that far exceeds anything he imagined. What, what does metadata tell you? If you look at all my phone calls, uh, you can know uh, whether I am, uh, I mean, you know, who I'm working for, where I am, where I'm going. Uh, whether I'm thinking about leaving my job and uh, secretly negotiating a deal with somebody else, uh, whether I have a disease that I don't want uh, to advertise because I, I'm going to some, I'm calling a clinic uh, and arranging appointments on a regular basis, whether I'm having an affair, whether, I mean, whether there are all kinds of very personal details that you can tell by drawing a map of someone's contacts without knowing anything about what was said in them. And so you're giving a lot of power to some entity, whether it's a government entity, to know those sorts of things. Uh, and frankly, in my case, as a reporter trying to protect confidential sources, which are not usually someone like Snowden, but may very well be um, someone sitting, you know, three seats down from uh, the congressman or someone working for one of those folks or someone working for the president or someone you know in private industry i i don't especially want anybody to have a map of everybody i'm talking to the uh, in defense of the program uh, the nsa and the administration have have talked about uh, 
its effectiveness in stopping uh, what otherwise might have been other terrorist attacks against the United States. To the extent that you've you've seen their examples, you've seen their arguments. Is any of it ring true? Yes, uh, I uh, I've seen their relatively indistinct public arguments. I've seen some evidence of the sort that I'm not going to publish. Uh, and taken collectively, these programs do find out important things. <laughs> it's always a question of where to draw the line. I mean, if you're if you're I mean to take it out of the realm of cyber and bits and bytes and think about the village cop. There's 100 people in the village, you know, 100 houses, a bicycle gets stolen. The easiest way to find it is search every house. But that's not the way we've chosen to do things in this country. We've talked, we've talked about probable cause and the <coughs> amendment and, and, and not simply going, in fact, we were founded because of resentment in part of exactly that kind of uh, technique, the general warrant <coughs> in George. So, there's a bit of a parallel here. I mean, do you have to have kind of a pervasive surveillance apparatus um, operating under the rules it's operating under now? And rules which, by the way, the US government intended not for people to know ever. I mean, Bob Litt is the general counsel of, uh, of the director of national intelligence. And he and I have had a lot of conversations lately. And we, uh, we once spent a couple of days together at a uh, conference, a very small group. Uh, talking about balance between national security, secrecy, and self-government. So we got to know each other pretty well, and we didn't agree on that much, but, uh, but we, had, we had pretty good conversations. Uh, and he was asked at a public hearing, uh, did you really expect that the American people would never find out that you were collecting all of our phone calls? And he said, well, we tried. <laughs> So uh, I want to talk a little bit. There's, a, there's a, obviously a, a huge fascination in the public about Mr. Stone and about the implications beyond the substance of, of, of the information that he disclosed, uh, but about the process that relates to him. Um, and I don't, I, I haven't seen um, whether or not you've, you've gone on the record on this question before. Um, should, in your view, Snowden have come back to the United States and, and faced the courts uh, as many other uh, leaders or, or, uh, or purported leaders of civil disobedience movements in American history have done. Um, does his seeking amnesty in a hostile country uh, raise questions about his credibility in your mind? Okay, so first, could I ask any former United States attorneys or uh, people presently holding a badge or a gun to cover your ears. <laughs> uh, look, seriously, I, I, he, is, he is my source. He, I'm one of the three journalists that Snowden uh, reached out to and uh, talked to virtually. I've never heard his voice until he was on video. I never met him. We talked by uh, secure textual communication. Uh, He's my source. He's, I, there's a legitimate question about did he do the right thing or the wrong thing, or attempting to sort of you know psychoanalyze his motives from afar, or assess the um, sort of credibility of his claims of high purpose. And they're not conversations that I can part or should participate in. I mean, they're they're fair questions. Uh, I can tell you factually what I what I uh, perceive because I mean. A very big part of what I do for a living is to uh, test my understanding of someone's motives uh, in order to try to assess the credibility of facts the person is alleging. And I spent months before I found out who he was. I, mean, I, was, I was spent months in an anonymous correspondence with him. He was just a person uh, on the other end of the made-up handle um, who purported to know uh, important information about uh, domestic surveillance and purported to have a document at that time, I thought it was going to be a document, that would uh, illuminate the question. And if you're a reporter who writes about national security, you get um, more of those tips uh, than turn out to be for real. Uh, and most, most of them are easy to dismiss as, as pranks or bakers or whatever early on. This one didn't seem that way. But it took a long time to authenticate uh, what he was saying and to decide that it raised issues of uh, public importance. So I can answer questions about 
you know, sort of what we communicate and how we communicate, what, what, I, what I think his, what I, what I understand his purpose is to be, but I'm not going to make judgments about what he should have done. Um, what do you think uh, about the, uh, the sort of uh, extremely odd bedfellows that have been created in our politics uh, since uh, your initial stories? You, you have Nancy Pelosi agreeing more or less with Lindsey Graham uh, on the sort of issue of uh, Snowden being criminal or should be punished. You have Michael Moore and Rand Paul um, also on the same side. And this has really scrambled the eggs of uh, the sort of traditional uh, alignments that we're, that we're used to. Um, first, I guess, part of, that, part of the question is, did you anticipate any of that? And, and secondly, uh, what do you think the long-term consequences of that are for our public? Well, back in 2005, I wrote a story about the FBI's use of uh, something called national security letters, which are administrative subpoenas that the FBI can write for itself, uh, saying, hand me over certain categories of data, uh, that say this to a telephone company or, uh, or to, uh, well, there are certain other institutions. There, there are a limited category, number of categories of information they're allowed to use these things. Uh, and it's a secret power because when you, if, if they go to Verizon Wireless and say, give me Gelman's phone records, now this is based on, uh, on a standard that says that uh, the information is uh, related to an authorized national security investigation. Uh, they tell Verizon, you're not allowed to tell BART or anybody else ever uh, that we asked for this or that you gave it to us. Uh, and the existence of this power, the existence of the NSLs was known and the uh, the threshold requirement for using it was substantially reduced by the Patriot Act. Uh, but the US government wouldn't talk about how many times it was being used. I mean, they said even, the, even an estimate, even a range of numbers about how, how often we use this NSL power uh, would gravely damage the security of the United States. Uh, and so I did a story that disclosed the numbers, and there were you know, tens of thousands a year. Uh, and the idea that, I mean, since everybody kind of at a gut level understands there are not tens of thousands of terrorists in America, uh, and that each one of those NSLs can get the records of a, a substantially, potentially a large number of people, um, this feels a little intrusive. And there was a whole debate. And it, the same debate united the same kinds of factions. Just to say that there's obviously an important strain of the Republican Party that is suspicious of government and the accumulation of government power, um, that sort of the, the don't tread on me, uh, the uh, sort of the libertarian wing of the party. Uh, and there are, you know, there are, there are parts of the Democratic Party that align with them. And I actually think it's a very healthy thing if every now and then you see a coalition emerging <laughs> in which not everybody's on the same partisan side of the divide and that there are, there, there are sort of points of view that can and bridge those. I don't know whether that's a precedent for much of anything else. I don't know how long it'll last. I have been surprised by how long the debate that Snowden provoked has lasted already, and by the fact that there's not much sign that it's dissipating. I mean, his greatest fear, well, his greatest fear was that he'd be preempted, that he would lay all these plans and try to convey the information to journalists, but somehow be sort of stopped and the stories would never be published. And his next greatest fear was that there would be a day or two splashy story and then everyone would move on and forget about it. He wanted to provoke a big debate. I think he has succeeded in that beyond any plausible ambition. So the, the president has proposed uh, a number of, uh, again, purported reforms, changes uh, in, in these programs and, and uh, called for a greater degree of transparency. Uh, the congressman talked about uh, uh, greater oversight by Congress. Uh, have you heard, to your own mind, uh, policy prescriptions uh, that, uh, that you think would put back in the bottle the genie of Orwellian power that you described earlier? Or is there some other policy prescription that you think is really required? Well, you should go to bed every night thanking your lucky stars that no one put me in charge of policy prescriptions. 
And as far as predictions, um, it's something I often tell people is that if you catch me making a prediction and you think you can commoditize it, you should sell it short. I'm um, wrong much more often than I'm right. I, I like that about the world. I like being in an empirical pr uh, profession and sort of watching what actually does happen. All that said. Uh, I mean, I would have to say that the response of the intelligence community and the president has been uh, to find a line that they can defend. Uh, they fall back a very small amount at a time. Uh, so it's disclosed that there is this database in which they're collecting all domestic call records. Uh, and then they put out word, well, we'll disclose to you that last year uh, we queried that database fewer than 300 times. And then somewhere else, some days later, they put out a document that says that that number has varied from year to year. Now, when they put out the number 300 and then they say it's varied, you can be pretty confident that it has not varied below 300. <laughs> uh, and eventually, uh, because of additional disclosures and, and, and uh, the government's decide, decision to declassify documents in response to those disclosures, now we find out that there was a, there was a time when there were many thousands a year in which it was queried, and in which the FISA court felt that it had been in the FISA court. The specialized court that meets in secret um, in a classified forum to, uh, to uh, either approve warrants or to supervise programs um, in, in uh, foreign intelligence surveillance. Uh, so there have been at least two occasions in which the FISA court felt that it had been uh, badly misled, that the government wasn't doing what it said it was doing in these programs. Uh, one in which the court ruled that uh, the program that was as it was being executed was uh, unconstitutional and statutorily deficient as well. Uh, and that all sounds like a good thing in terms of oversight, you know, an independent body that's, some, that's sometimes able to, to check the program. It's also the case that the chief judge, Reggie Walton, who I knew when he was um, running murder trials at DC Superior Court, uh, recently told my colleague, uh, Carol Lenning at the Washington Post, if it was only the second on the record interview ever by a FISA judge, a court that is not used to speaking in public. And he said, uh, we rely on the government to bring information to us. We have no independent capacity to find out what they're doing. And so what the court ruled on in 2009 as being, a, uh, as, as being unlawful and required the government to change had been going, already, uh, going on for some years already. And I'm pretty confident, I haven't you know, sort of fully unpacked what happened here, I'm pretty confident that no one in the Justice Department fully understood it either. Sooner or later, there, there's a conversation in which they're talking about their position in this or an adjustment of that, and somebody in the NSA says something, and someone in DOJ says, wait, you're doing what? For, for how long have you been doing this? And so three years go by and finally gets brought to the attention of the court. Uh, and uh, there are things like that that, that involve the, uh, the Intelligence Committee in Congress as well. That do you have, look, I, I the, the, the intelligence budget of the United States runs to thousands of pages. Uh, they have, you know, something close to, you know, 4.5 full-time equivalent staffers on the Intelligence Committee um, who can sort of try to oversee that budget, thousands of pages, uh, and, and, you know, 100 plus thousand employees of the intelligence community. Uh, so it, you are going to rely substantially on self-reporting, uh, no matter what. And it always raises questions when you have a very powerful institution, uh, uh, the accountability of which depends, let's say in this case, primarily on self-reporting. Let's turn to the question of, of uh, the unauthorized access to, to the content of Americans' communication. Um, so the NSA, has, uh, has argued, the administration has argued, that unauthorized access to content uh, is aberrational, that it's uh, prevented largely by internal safeguards and protocols. I'd like to hear your reaction to that. I'd also like you to comment, if you, if you would, on sort of the proposition that the fact, as it's been reported, that the NSA does not know precisely what Snowden saw or took 
doesn't that prove that the precautions are rather easily defeated? I wouldn't say easily, but it proves that they can be defeated. And one of the maxims of cybersecurity people uh, is that uh, when someone like, if the, when an insider threat appears, when you suddenly discover uh, that you've been leaking information, um, you're not discovering that it, that it just happened to you. You're not discovering that it's the first time. You're discovering um, that it's an open door and that it's probably been used before. Uh, for every Snowden, well, there isn't any other Snowden. They, they, there's never in American history been someone who uh, brought information from uh, inside the government to reporters and then stood up a few days later and said, you know, that was me, I did that. Uh, I mean, Daniel Ellsberg didn't do that. Uh, none of the other sort of notorious or celebrated leak cases um, from the decades since then, none of them, zero, have ever come forward voluntarily. Now, some of them, after having been caught, uh, will deny it. Some of them, having been identified, will come out and say, yes, I did that, and here's why. And that's more like the Ellsberg case. Snowden is unique in uh, the choices he made. So think about the fact that he had this extraordinary access around the databases of the intelligence community, and the fact that someone who had that access uh, could be using it um, for genuine espionage, uh, stealthily handing it over to a foreign power, uh, or selling it, or some other nefarious purpose. Uh, the, the odds that that person is going to come out and raise his hand and hand it off to reporters, that, that's sort of the least probable and the unique case. So I would say, in fact, that, that his ability to exfiltrate very large quantities of information uh, and to communicate without being surveilled from the world's greatest surveillance agency over a period of months with multiple communicants uh, demonstrates that the safeguards, although sincerely intended uh, and very considerable, aren't bulletproof. Then he's probably not the first. So, so to go back to the, to the other half of that, do you think that this audience and other ordinary Americans should be worried about the government of the United States looking at the content of their personal the government of the United States is not trolling through everybody's content uh, for the heck of it. Uh, and, you know, when they say they don't care about your Aunt Millie's cookie recipe, that's true, they don't. Uh, they do care a lot about networks of people, and they are, they have, I mean, they have the ability to draw these networks, not only in terms of phone communications, but also more significantly for me and for lots of people in this room, internet communications. Uh, and I've said, and I genuinely mean, that if you gave me a choice of having my metadata entirely in somebody's, you know, so if you, could, if you could either, I get to either hand you over a month of my metadata, all the phone logs, all the internet logs, no content, or you get to listen to all my calls for a month, I'd much rather you listen to my calls. You learn a lot more about me. Uh, you learn things about me that I probably haven't told anybody. Uh, because, I mean, nobody knows all the different compartments of my life, uh, and, you know, not even my wife. I mean, there, there, are, um, there are things you don't tell your kids, things you don't tell your boss, things you, things you don't tell, you know, your, your close friends. Uh, and many of them can be inferred uh, from the metadata. So I personally don't like at all having any entity collecting large amounts of my metadata. Uh, and I think we should be concerned at the secret accumulation of power. You know, in some ways, it's not a secret at all. Congress passed a law. You know, the FISA Amendments Act of 2008, renewed in 2012, has a section 702, which gives the government the power to go to Google and Yahoo and AOL and Microsoft, not by name, but to go to communications providers and get content. Uh, under relaxed rules in comparison to, I mean, it used to be you had to have an individual warrant. You had to have probable cause, or at least you had to have something called reasonable articulable suspicion. And that is, that is no longer the case. I mean, that's not the way the program works now. Um, the requirements are relaxed. So we knew that there was some relaxation of requirements. But, the, but statutes, generally speaking, uh, 
don't spell out all the details. They, they need to be interpreted. Uh, the U.S. government secretly interpreted the, the, you know, the stat that and other statutes to say that a program under which they, it, they used to be able to give a warrant and say, let me have, you know, in the old days they called it a, a, pen, a pen register uh, and a trap and trace order. You know, in the old analog world, you know, you've got these little mechanical gadgets that go, did you dial, did you dial you, and so on, and you could get a warrant for that. Uh, we have reason to suspect uh, Bart, he's a bad guy, we want to know all his phone calls. But that's for one person, or one, actually it's for one facility, and that's usually defined as a, say, for example, a telephone number. And they secretly interpret the law to mean that they can get all of them. Uh, I mean, which by definition means you can't have any probable cause, reasonable articulate suspicion, any other particular suspicion at all. I mean, you want all of it. Uh, and, it and I mean, the more you have, the more you sort of take the whole haystack, the more you approach certainty that there will be something relevant in there, just as if you searched all the houses in the village. But you've removed what we would commonly understand to be the tradition of uh, needing to suspect some individual before you start poking around in that individual's life. Uh, so what I'm worried about is that they take a fairly broad statute, they interpret it in a way that nobody I know, and I followed surveillance issues pretty closely in my last book, I talked to lots of experts, nobody I know ever imagined that they were interpreting it this broadly, and they get a secret court to endorse that interpretation. Uh, and then they start doing things, all with perfectly plausible motives, all because they think they're protecting you, uh, and they want to protect you, and there are real threats, and there are real benefits to these programs. But when you have a powerful institution doing its business, completely insulated from public opinion, with people surrounded by people who do the same thing for a living and make the same assumptions, they talk themselves into things that seem normal and natural, but as soon as you say them out loud in public, people are shocked, and that's what's happened to you. I want to, uh, want to bring our audience into this. Uh, just, there's one more. I've asked a couple of questions that are designed to get you to sort of go beyond your brief as a reporter and, and uh, either play psychiatrist or a policymaker. Um, so my last question tries again to sort of do that um, on, a, on a grander scale. I'm becoming like a press secretary. No comment. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I'd like to get your thoughts uh, on, on the evolution uh, of, of, our, of our president, um, who campaigned as a fiery critic of the Bush-Cheney national security apparatus, um, and has become a defender, and some would say an extender, uh, of, of that apparatus. Some people see in this idea um, a uh, an evolution compelled by following his oath, an evolution that shows intellectual and moral honesty. Other people uh, see uh, a corruption and a sort of gravitational pull of secrecy and, and power. Uh, and I'm sure there are lots of, lots of positions in between. What would be your view? My view is that no president walks in office and is handed a toolbox and says, OK, I don't need this one, this one, or this one. Uh, that's, uh, I'm just going to set that one aside. Uh, you, you have such enormous responsibility in that office, and you have access to information you didn't have access to before about scary things that are or could be happening out there. Uh, and no toolbox could possibly feel adequate. I mean, you know, the problems aren't supposed to get to the Oval Office unless they're the really hard ones. You know, if they're easy ones, let somebody six levels down take care of that one. Uh, and so, every single decision with Syria or, you know, or, or, uh, or surveillance or all kinds of, you know, any, any one of those um, is excruciatingly hard. And in many cases, it really is the least worst uh, set of options. You know, you're looking for something that's not as bad as all the other ones. Uh, and so I think you come in having said that uh, you're very skeptical of, uh, of some of these surveillance programs, or say things that uh, that seem very skeptical of a, pre of a presidential power uh, to decide on his own um, who's going to send a flying killer robot to kill overseas, uh, and then you find yourself doing that. I mean, you know, you've got you've got uh, sort of people you think really are bad guys who are really plotting significant attacks, and 
maybe they're operating in a country where uh, if you send people in to capture that person, uh, you're going to create all sorts of problems or take all sorts of risks. Maybe uh, you're you're completely burned by the fact that the uh, that you can't figure out a way to close Guantanamo, uh, and you don't have any place that you can put this person. Uh, and so it's either kill him or let him go about his business and see, uh, and see if you can stop him when he gets to your border. And you know, you try all the other alternatives. You say, come on, people, there must be something. And they don't have something. And so you say, OK, well, now I'm a big fan of flying killer robots. Uh, so uh, because I, you know, everything else looks worse. So I mean, I, I think that there's, a, there's, there's that, with, which happens with every president. Uh, and uh, I guess I'm also not going to shrink uh, President Obama for the rest of the question. OK. Um, I'd like to take uh, questions from the audience, which can be directed either to, uh, to Bart or to the congressman. Do you want to, Pat, do you want to come, come up? Yeah. Questions are fine. OK. We're fine. OK. Um, please, sir. Um, yeah, um, would you change what we wrote the Let's put all the switches 
on the internet, and we'll have a control room here. Now we're going to drive around 600 square miles to uh, you know, flip the switches on the dam or on the electrical grid or uh, on some other critical infrastructure. And when they built those, they were thinking how cool it was and how handy it was, and they didn't think a lot about security. And some of them actually can't be upgraded for, uh, to be password protected, or some of them have you know, sort of a standard, like you know, the password is password uh, and can be upgraded. And then they're, you know, they're building new generations of better ones. But that's a, probably tens or hundreds of billions. Uh, you know, the Congress would know better than I would, but that's a gigantic investment that will take many years. So there's a threat. Uh, it is uh, arguments about the new age of threats have been used lots of times, even in recent years, in debates over enhanced interrogation. Well, I mean, maybe maybe you need to do something that borders on torture uh, because the uh, the threat is so high. Um, it's been used. It's been used for um, indefinite detention. It's been used for surveillance. It's been used in a number of other sort of uh, national security versus civil liberties debates, and I think that's a healthy debate to have as long as we're having it out in the open. Um, I would personally doubt that either the threat of Al Qaeda or the threat of cyber attack um, exceeds the imminence and and uh, lethality of something we've been living with for. What is it? 63 years now, which is uh, which is a national opponent with uh, hydrogen bombs and mounted on missiles that can be here 30 minutes from the time they push the button, and less if they use submarines that are in our neighborhood. Uh, and we've had to live with that. We've had to try to keep some sort of balance in mind throughout. So I mean, where you draw the line exactly, for sure, is going to differ based on uh, on on the uh, the scale and probability and imminence of the threat that you're worried about. But you're still going to have to draw a line somewhere, and you're still going to have to try to preserve some of the basic values we were founded on, or else what's the point of calling ourselves different? Please. Mr. Galvin. Do you extend your positions on the civil liberties of people in, with regards to the collection of metadata? to international communities, be they alleged or actual, such as the recent allegations that data is being collected by the NSA in Belgium? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. That's an important question, and it's something that Snowden has a clear view on. Uh, I mean, Snowden has aligned himself with uh, an ideology that sort of grew up in the 80s and 90s uh, called, you know, called the cypherpunks, who uh, believed who were deeply suspicious of any accumulated state power, uh, who believed that big entities almost inevitably are self-dealing and corrupt, and that the answer is in technology, the, you know, the technology of anonymity and the technology of encryption, so that people can't uh, tell what you're saying or even who you are, so that you can communicate, people can organize from the grassroots, you know, from the outside in. Uh, and he is therefore uh, not much less concerned about sort of mass surveillance of Belgians or um, anybody else than he is of, of Americans. That, that has not been the premise of my coverage or the coverage of the Washington Post. Other news organizations have done different things. I am not personally shocked um, that our foreign intelligence agencies are spying on foreigners. Uh, and I don't think that it raises very big accountability issues in terms of you know American public policy and the American political system. And so I'm not writing stories saying, um, look, um, the US government is spying on you know anybody. I mean, we're, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not prepared to write about particular targets of uh, surveillance. And there are stories that, I mean, look, just from a storytelling, a journalistic point of view, you, you know, you, you look at it and you say, wow, that is, wow, that's an amazing story. And I, you know, part of me wishes I could write it because it's really cool. And it's really interesting. And it sheds light on something that people have been talking about. You know, about some, you know, could be on proliferation of nuclear weapons. Uh, and it's not even a close call. We just have to do it. Uh, I'm not interested in that. I'm, I'm primarily interested in ways in which uh, this material can, uh, first of all, raise questions for domestic political debate about the limits of public uh, of, of, of government power, and also can illuminate 
the facts about what's happening in the world. So I mean, one of the, I mean, I talked before about the secret intelligence budget. Uh, intelligence budget spends on the order of $50 uh, billion dollars a year. Uh, it is that number, only in very recent years, since I think it's 2007, has been made public. Just the grand total of 16 agencies, $50 billion. Literally everything else about the intelligence budget has been classified top secret or higher uh, for s the 70 years that there was a separate intelligence budget. Uh, once in 1994, pardon the expression, the Congressional Committee accidentally uh, leaked a little bit more information about how much each agency got, but, but the details have never been public. So now here I am sitting on half 1,400 pages of this so-called black budget. Uh, and there are things in there. I mean, obviously, you can, what the Post thinks should be public um, is demonstrated by the fact that we reproduced on our website 25 tables out of 1,400, uh, which were the big statistical tables. You know, how much does each agency get? What kind? Of, you know, big picture. You know, human intelligence gets this, and technical intelligence gets that. Uh, there are lots of there's lots of information in there, though, that tells you about the world. Uh, we worry a lot, for example, as a matter of national policy, how do you balance all our different interests with Pakistan? Pakistan is, you know, it is a putative ally um, against Al Qaeda, but it also has a strong interest in making sure the Taliban doesn't completely collapse because that's part of its balance of power calculation with India and with Afghanistan, and uh, it is. Well, I mean, it, it's a nuclear power that, uh, in the past, it's the head of its nuclear program tried to sell a lot of nuclear technology to other countries, which the United States government didn't think was a very good thing. Uh, the U.S. government is still worried about the stability of control of Pakistani nuclear weapons. So I wrote a story from the budget documents and other, and other reporting that we did separately that talked about the, very, the complexity of the relationship with Pakistan and the concerns, for example, about its nuclear weapons and the fact that as a proliferation risk, the U.S. intelligence community says there's Pakistan and then there's everybody else. That's the way it divides the world in terms of concerns. You know, when the Congress is debating the billions of dollars of aid that you know, we send there and how you balance all the different interests we have uh, in Pakistan, I think that's relevant. There were things in that story originally I mean, first of all, there were things that we never considered publishing, as I said before, uh, including in that story. And there were things that we did consider publishing, and, and I, I, uh, I and my colleagues consulted with government, and they talked us out of putting some things in. But let me give you one example of something they did not talk us out of uh, removing from the paper. It was the very first story on prison. And it was very clear in those conversations that the number one secret, the thing they most wished we would not publish was the names of the nine internet companies that were providing the information to the NSA. Uh, and I said, and I, I'm a former employee of the Washington Post back on contract, so I you know, didn't really have the power to speak for the company, but I said, hey, you know, this is going to be a made above my pay grade, but I'll tell you my response. My response is, if the harm you're concerned about consists in the American public and the customers of Facebook and Microsoft and AOL uh, not liking what they're doing when they find out about it and taking their business elsewhere, that's why we need to publish it. Uh, I mean, the core virtue of accountability, the core sort of mission of a newspaper and accountability stories is to give people information so that they can act on it. I mean, if the government's point of view is that something should be secret because if the people find it out, they will make the wrong decision and stop us from doing this thing we want to do. That is fundamentally, I think, uh, counter to uh, the idea of self-government, and that's not something that I'm prepared to discuss. Thank you. Please. Um, this is for uh, Congressman Mead. Would you tell us more about the intelligence bill that you are proposing? I, I think I spoke a little bit about it. I'd be happy to give you a breakdown on it. Thank you. Uh, Bart, you mentioned two things. One is that if you want to, to keep something secret, don't put it on the internet, and you don't want your metadata out there. 
So what do we as individuals, taking it from the macro to the micro, do? I mean, when there is an electrical blackout, we go back to candles <laughs> and flashlights. Do we go back to using paper? Do we get our bank statements, you know, in the mail instead of online? What are some of the things that we can do to, or not join Facebook, for example? How do we keep ourselves secure? That's a really interesting question, and one that has occupied me a substantial amount of my time for several years now, <laughs> and more so lately. Uh, for metadata, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it other than not use the technology. Uh, you can, I mean, I'm, I, I'm very well aware of the multiple functions served, you know, by this, uh, you know, and, and uh, I, I know what is collected routinely about me, you know, whether, whether I'm, you know, Barbara, Joe, or anybody else. Uh, and I'm aware that uh, under special circumstances, if I become a target of special interest by someone very capable, this thing can be turned into a microphone and uh, they, can track, they, can, they can track my location, they can actually turn it into a microphone even if the power is off as long as the battery is in there. And so there have been times when I leave it behind. Uh, I, I am, for the first time in my life, I can plausibly expect that uh, I'm a target of special interest from some, you know, by somebody capable. You know, and I, I, my primary concern is to make sure that you know, some foreign government doesn't get access to the information that I have and I don't think should be public. So I'm taking a lot of steps on that. Uh, but even now, I'm a reporter. I need to function in the world. I have, you know, I, I, I use computers. I use telephones. I, I, there, are, there are tools that are not that easy to learn, but, you know, are learnable within a few hours by any sort of intelligent person who wants to make a try. Uh, by which you can encrypt the content of your email, or uh, which you can um, make it very hard to identify, you know, who you are or where you are when you're communicating, and there are times when I use that. I mean, it was a price of entry to talk to Snowden. If I, if I had not previously learned how to use the anonymizing and encryption technology, I couldn't have talked to him. It was the only way in which he was prepared to communicate. Um, and I thought I knew a lot about it by then, and it turned out that I didn't know as much as I could, and he instructed me on some additional steps to make it even more secure, and they were sufficiently secure that he was able to do it for months and not get caught. So it is possible to do it, but it takes a lot of effort, and it takes a lot of discipline. There's no push button answer. I mean, for example, there's this, there's something that invented by the US Navy called Tor, the onion router for, for anonymizing communication. So suppose you just consider it a black box, that you, uh, if you're using that, then whoever you're talking to on the internet, it would be very, very difficult, uh, if not impossible, for them to figure out what your IP address is, where you're, the, you know, where you're from. It might look like you're in the Netherlands when you're in Philadelphia. Um, so suppose you create an email, Donald Duck at Gmail, um, and you created using this black box that disguises where you are, uh, then, uh, then identifying you is going to be very, very, very hard. Uh, but if you access that 900 times, always using the box, um, and then one time you forget and you log on from your regular computer, it's as if you never used it. Uh, it now you're associated with that account, and, you know, and then all the previous connections are now associated with you. So it's tough. I mean, if, 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 Technology offers some help, but it's only going to be law and policy uh, that shift the line. Please. And this question was originally for Congressman Mann, but he's not here right now. <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask you this question anyway. Seeing as how you're in Washington and you see a lot of cybersecurity efforts, have you been, one of the things that I've observed, and I'm going to speak on the record, I am a cybersecurity executive. I protect information security for my employer. I'm not going to say who they are. But one of the things that I've noticed is that there's a lot of effort in trying to do pro reactive solutions instead of proactive solutions. Is that something that you've observed in your reporting and your analysis of cybersecurity in this country? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's something we all observe about the world and human behavior in, in pretty much every sphere. I mean, it, it, it's. Most of us, most of the time, are reacting to external stimuli. It's very hard to sort of sit down and say, okay, switch off the inbox, you 
you know, switch off all the numbers for the boss. Let me think about, you know, what might be coming down the road and prepare for that. So for sure, there's that. Um, I mean, one of the things that can be said about cybersecurity is that it's, you know, like it is, it is a, it, it is a smart, interesting set of conversations that we hear from the U.S. government, including what we've heard today about the cybersecurity threat. Um, it's also a fact that uh, the United States government has become one of the, you know, one of the uh, most pervasive and powerful cyber offense threats to the rest of the world. So, I mean, it, the, the, one of the NSA's jobs is, besides computer network defense, is computer network exploitation and computer network attack. And so, you know, we, our government is devoting extraordinary resources uh, and ramping up its ability to conduct offensive operations in the world. And, and actually, offense is, considered, is a fairly narrow slice of what they do that you and I would consider, or might be, you know, that the lay person would consider to be. Offense. I mean, we, I, I, as briefly mentioned before, I did a story in which I disclosed that, uh, that the NSA has 85,000 implants in network devices around the world um, that are essentially what we call the advanced persistent threat uh, from very sophisticated adversaries like China in our networks. And each of those implants, is, they, they prefer not to use it, you know, sort of individual computer PCs, they refer to me on a router or a firewall that can see a lot of computers. So the NSA is sort of out there subverting and penetrating lots of computers elsewhere, and lots of people are trying to do that here, and it's, a, it's sort of a spy versus spy game of a different, in a different playing field that's harder and harder to see. Uh, time for just one last question over here. Uh, I think a big player in a lot of this stuff, uh, we had one to talk about would be like WikiLeaks. And we see an organization like WikiLeaks come to the foreground and lobby for Mr. Snowden to find asylum. And how do you as a journalist, you talk a lot about you know, journalists disseminating information, what should be put out, what should not be put out, versus an organization like WikiLeaks, which just puts it out and allows the public to decide what should and shouldn't be. So how do you as a journalist feel about an organization like WikiLeaks, and do you think that there's a place for that in the discourse? Well, first of all, it, 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 there's, a, there's a very interesting phenomenon uh, that WikiLeaks drew attention to, which is um, that you, know, you can make free, essentially free and instant and perfect copies of digital data. You know, Daniel Ellsberg came to my class. I taught a class on this stuff uh, once, and he came to my class. And he explained to my students how he copied the Pentagon Papers, 7,000 pages. And it was, you know, it was, it was the 70s, so it was, you know. <coughs> That's one page. Uh, I mean, it took him months, actually, to, uh, to do the Pentagon Papers. And now you can do something that is, I don't know, 100 million times bigger in, uh, in an hour. Uh, and so, I mean, the, the, there were quarter million uh, diplomatic cables, there were 500,000 Iraqi war log reports, another 200 some thousand Afghan war log reports on, in, in WikiLeaks, and you could fit it on a fingernail, and you could copy it quickly. So, you know, this is a phenomenon that you could say, well, like, should they or shouldn't they? This is, this is like talking about whether there should be rain. I mean, it, it, is, it is now a fact of our information environment that, uh, that it is almost impossible to prevent occasional large-scale leaks of information. So the question is how you configure yourself to deal with that. WikiLeaks does not, in fact, literally take information and just sort of dump it all out there. They actually have a long kind of lengthy sort of review and editing process, and they actually add some value to the information if you're just, you just want to look at it purely from the point of view of can you understand it. They, they format it and they look for links and they find ways of uh, sort of making, making it uh, more understandable and searchable and so on. And when it came to the cables, the diplomatic cables, WikiLeaks did not actually dump all quarter million of those tables, uh, cables onto the internet. Uh, it was releasing them in small batches, and it was allowing uh, the New York Times, and the Guardian, and the Dutch Spiegel, and uh, a couple of other partners to vet them with their governments. And it was allowing a certain amount of redaction, which is a 
stupid term for you know some blacking out words. Uh, and it was actually a Guardian reporter by accident who dumped the whole thing on the internet. It's actually a funny story if we've got two minutes for it, which is that WikiLeaks had put out, uh, you know, in a sort of melodramatic uh, show of deterrence, it had put out what it called its insurance file, a giant encrypted blob on the internet, which contained all of the cables. Uh, but it did not intend to release them all unedited. Uh, but it said, you know, you do something really bad to us, and who knows what's going to happen with this file. So that was all over the place. It was encrypted well enough that, um, as far as I understand, even in light of my more recent advances in knowledge, uh, no government can decrypt. Uh, and I downloaded it, like, like millions of other people did, against the possibility that one day the key would become public. And so a Guardian reporter named David Lay writes a memoir of his interaction with WikiLeaks and the epigraph. <coughs> For chapter 11 is a really long phrase uh, that starts with, you know, the history of foreign relations of the United States from blah, blah, blah. Uh, and he said, isn't the school? This was my password for uh, the WikiLeaks cache. He thought it was just his. Uh, okay. And it was everybody. I mean, and, and he writes this thing, and nothing happens. Four or five months go by. And then finally, some German newspaper didn't cite, notices, and puts a picture of that page on, it, on its website with a big thing that says, oops, and the headline. So I tried it. That was the password. Now the you know, Puerto Rican tables are, uh, are released in total. Uh, if, but I mean, to get to the question you really want, I think, to know. If WikiLeaks simply receives information and then makes it public to the global public at large, then legally and functionally, although it's making different judgments than I would, um, it is indistinguishable from what I do. If you could put Assange in jail for that, you could put me in jail for that. Uh, if, however, uh, they are giving, they're, they're aiding, abetting, conspiring, giving active assistance to the person who is uh, unlawfully taking the information, then that's a different role. Uh, their, the government has made some allegations in the uh, Bradley, now Chelsea Manning trial about, that alluded to a WikiLeaks role uh, that in helping Manning to, uh, to break into the systems. I mean, if that's the case, then it's a whole different thing. And when Edward Snowden, after having communicated with me for a long time, disclosed to me one day, hey, by the way, I'm in Hong Kong. Holy crap, I mean, you're, you're where? You're, you're under whose jurisdiction? Uh, uh, that, that changed my attitude pretty fast. And uh, I, I recognized that you know, I was reaching a new line, both sort of legally and ethically. Uh, and it, I wrote in a story, uh, so I won't say any more than I wrote, but I wrote in a story that he asked me to publish a story by a certain deadline to re and to put the document online in its entirety at, alongside a cryptographic signature, uh, which is a fan it's just fancy piece of math that by which he could prove that he was the source of that document. If I left the document unaltered, not even by a pixel, and published the key alongside it, then he could prove ownership of the key, and he could go into some foreign embassy and say, I can prove that I'm the source of that document and therefore have a, feel, a fear of what he would describe as political persecution and therefore you should give me asylum. So he was asking me to aid and abet his asylum request. And I said, you misunderstand our relationship. And I, I can't do that and won't do that. Um, and by the way, we're not going to publish all those slides because we don't think we should publish all those slides and we can't tell you exactly when we're going to write our story. But there was an important story there and we did publish it. But you know, that's the journalistic relationship as opposed to some other relationship.